Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Ravi Kohle. I'm a pathologist at Medical College, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia, the home of Augusta Nationals, the Masters Tournament if you're in golf. These are my disclosures, but most importantly, what I'm going to talk is personal and does not reflect with my collaborators or employer. Uh, I'm going to talk about three things. Some background on CGP or comprehensive genomic profiling in oncology, uh, the whole debate about doing it in-house versus send out, and then focus on what really has changed in the past five years. And towards the end, I'll talk a little bit about our path to reimbursement, especially how do we get that magical 81455 associated with your CGP assay. So how and why CGP is important? Um, I could give you a lot of data and, and publications, but I'm going to tell you a story on one of our patients. I've shared this with a few of you. But this is Mike, Mike Thames. He's a 31-year-old guy, very healthy. Comes in a clinic with the back pain. We did a peripheral smear. He ended up getting a, what we call is mixed lineage leukemia, which has both myeloid as well as lymphoid features. Pretty aggressive, but really good treating-wise. As routine, they started with uh, first line of chemo, which ended up being relapsed. Second line of chemo, which also relapsed. Third line of chemo relapsed. Fourth line of chemo, which also relapsed. And then <clears throat> after a few lines, they did a transplant. And the transplant also relapsed. So at this stage, when you, if you follow the, the biology of a clone, the more you start killing it, the selective presence of these clones became so aggressive that there was a change in the phenotype from a leukemia to sarcoma. So the, he ended up getting what we call as myeloid sarcoma. So these are small nodules in the skins and organs. So Mike, uh, we took a biopsy and was diagnosed as myeloid sarcoma by a hematopathologist. But the, the guy who was treating him, the transplanter, is a good friend, and he came to my office and said, listen, we are treating Mike with the exact same treatment plan as he started with this first line. We're just changing the drugs. The disease has changed from a leukemia to sarcoma. Uh, is there something which we can do? And at that time, I think we were still doing that 54G in myeloid panel as a starting point at the time of diagnosis. This was the time when we had in-house CGP assay, which is a DNA and RNA, and I said, let's, let's throw on this and see what happens. So we did the CGP assay. We found uh, some mutations in the mTOR and proteasome pathway. We talked to the family, got an IRB approval, convinced the peers, and started on mTOR inhibitors on him. And not to a surprise, he walked out of ICU um, walked out of ICU, CR was achieved purely on mTOR inhibitors, went home for Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, ran 5K, and he's raising money for the lab. And he has raised enough money that we have started a project called Thousand Mics. So the idea is we're going to give this test to 1,000 individuals who don't have resources to pay through Mike's and his wife's foundation. But this is the reason why CGP is important. You, you could look up ASCO's data, CAP's data, CGC's data. CGP is the single most critical, important piece in the precision oncology phase. There is no precision oncology unless you do comprehensive genomic profiling. That, that's it. Unfortunately, we are still struggling with convincing the peers that this is important. We, they're still asking for medical necessity of CGP in the whole precision oncology treatment. And I, I blame it on us and our organizations and whatever your fellowship is with, that they are not convincing peers good enough that, and the drop of CGP is, a, is a, literally a drop in a bucket of the entire cost of treating a patient. It's absolutely nothing. I mean, if you go on oncology rounds and the, the kind of treatment they're throwing out on the walls without a CGP is absolutely atrocious if you look at the cost. Uh, but we're still not able to convince people that 
especially the pairs on the other side, that this is important. So I think this, this is something we need to really work on and change. So what are these challenges which we deal with? Um, they're clinical, financial, and administrative. And I'll go with them quickly. This is a good paper if you have time and if you're early in implementation of precision oncology and trying to bring it in-house. Uh, it's a good review on really small details which are really needed. So let's start with the assay itself. I mean, what, what prevents lab from realizing the promise of NGS? So number one, there are so many fragmented workflows. You really have to go to five, ten different vendors to get the things done in timely fashion. Analyzing and interpretation of data is really critical, and the cost of doing it, especially the startup capital, is pretty expensive. So how do you do, deal with it? And there are still other financial challenges, especially uh, the coverage of NGS by payers. I mean, Medicare at least agreed, but they still say that they only pay for one NGS test for the entirety of the diagnosis, which is, again, ridiculous, but at least we have started or we have come to the phase where there is acceptance on the payers that NGS is required and, and is a part of the precision medicine treatments. The, now, a lot of private payers want prior authorization for genomic testing. That adds a lot of pressure on labs to get that authorization before you start treatment. And if, if you look at ASCO's 2018 data, peer pressure is the number one burden on practices, and on top of that, prior authorization is the top prayer pressure. And then how do you deal with it? I think this is where the organizations like us and, and other come in play, and we have to really convince peers that CGP is critically important and the most important part of the precision oncology. And, and, and again, I come back to this again and again, our decades of experience of treating advanced cancer patients by traditional methods of chemotherapy and radiotherapy have failed. These tumors advance, they, they come back, they become metastatized, there's a relapse, and then precision oncology is the starting point, especially in areas like IO and PARP inhibitors, where a CGP will definitely make a difference. There's another issue with uh, uh, NGS testing is patient burden, and usually labs would say, oh, there is no charge to your practice or no charge to the patient, but we deal with uh, bills like this when patients bring to the lab from the send-out lab for these assays. So it's extremely important that the, the, the you as a pathologist or lab directors understand what exactly is happening during your send-out process. So what has changed in the last five years? So if you have not looked at what, what has changed, this is a summary. The number one thing is the cost of sequencing has gone tremendously. Uh, if you've been to AGBT or PMWC, there were five new sequencers showcased. Two of them will definitely see of light, I think. Um, then by end of November, one of them is ready to be shipped, and which I think is going to dramatically change the cost of sequencing, which is the number one issue. The utility of NGS is really growing and exploding to the extent that the utility in IO and PARP in the better with HRD scores. There is a relative clarity of reimbursement now, as, as opposed to, I would say, five years ago. There are FDA-approved NGS assays, which, is, which makes this critically different what five years was before. There are NCDs by CMS, LCDs by local max, which clearly states what assays you can do, what will be the reimbursement, and, and each and every MAC has a different, but there is a true number associated with CGP where you can actually get paid by Medicare for doing it for Medicare beneficiaries. So these, some of these or combination of these things have dramatically changed in the last five years. In the case of send out, I would say I mean, there are so much inefficiencies in send out, getting a block, putting it together. Turnaround time is a major issue. I don't have to tell you in a send out how long it takes, 15 to 21 days. Uh, by the time a patient, I mean, especially if you're in a, a rural or a community setting, uh, patients do not wait for 21 days to come and wait the results. They usually, oncologists, end up starting chemotherapy by the time the results are back. Uh, it's challenging to submit 
technical assessment to MOLDEX. I don't know if anyone has gone through that process, but it is one of the most challenging process to get uh, approved your LDT. And again, it's a very cost prohibitive uh, to do that. Uh, but more importantly, oncologists and cancer centers are getting more comfortable with their genomic data on their patients and then really pushing for a personalized medicine program or precision medicine initiative to have that data put in the cancer centers or in the system for their uh, clinical trials people or research folks to have a look at it. Uh, obviously, it has a great value for research and it played a very important role in the public health emergency response to have a, a precision medicine program in-house versus a standout. I mean, my lab pretty much run, uh, ran the, the entire state of Georgia COVID testing and sequencing for the last two years because we had the systems in, the, in, the, in our lab. And, and, and it is a major component in the academic centers for teaching medical students, uh, residents, and fellows uh, to, to, ha to make them understand this. I know these are all extremely valid and important point, but the most important point is your hospital administrators. When I was recruited 10 years ago, NGS was a cost center. Nobody was ready to touch it. Every administrator said, oh, send, send out to this. We don't need to worry about the cost. And now if you talk to any of them, they have realized that not only it is revenue generating, but we can make money out of in-house NGS testing because of the clarity of the NCDs and LCDs. And that dramatic change in the administration is one of the most driving reason why NGS testing is being brought in-house. So what, what did we do? Uh, why, why we chose PGDX? Uh, so there's a major difference between verification and validation. So PGDX, ileo tissue complete is an IVD. So it was a straight for us to go and finish verification versus another LDT, which will take pretty significant amount of time, efforts, and cost to get validated. And on top of that, you need a TA to get reimbursed. So in my lab, we, we do a lot of NGS validation to the extent that anytime I bring a project, the lab techs get really angry. So we have created this exercise called Colhe 10, and you, we really go through these 10 points to make sure that the new validation which I bring in is, is really making any difference to the existing protocol. So we look at, is, is there a clinical need? Are we really answering any specific question? What's the system and platform? Uh, is it well established? Is it evidence-based? It's peer-reviewed? Is it truly, I mean, there is so much of, uh, false information and automation uh, that you basically, <laughs> when any time automation is brought in for library prep, uh, there are some techs leave the room. Because you, yes, we bring this automated instrument, but you have to babysit that. You literally physically have to sit in front of this instrument and make sure everything is running till the automation is done. So instead of babysitting these automated instruments, they prefer doing it manually. So you, you will really have to go all through this every time we bring in a new assay in-house. And then one of the things which we are really now looking at the point number 10, which is uh, integration into uh, medical system, how can we uh, use, harness the data, uh, and make it available for researchers on campus, and, and so on. And, and, and the, the last two points, whether you need a 501k, you need uh, IVD, or how does the reimbursement for the assay which you're going to bring in the lab will make a difference. So just to give an example, when we went through this exercise, the PGDX LEO tissue checked all the 10, and we usually have a cutoff of eight to bring anything new in my lab. And then there are some of the things like the scalable, uh, because it's, it's only, you can run it on NextSeq DX. Uh, the interpretation is locked in because it's an IVD. So some of these things you really have to work on to make sure it fits in with your workflow. But I would say the most important points the system got was number 10 uh, is a reimbursement. It is a very straightforward reimbursement path. So we did the verification, we took the data, we went to Maldex. Maldex is our MAC uh, for, for Palmetto region and we, we submitted all that information. Um, and, and as I said earlier, we do not, if it's an IBD, you don't need a technical assessment 
to get an 81455. Uh, it was relatively the, probably the least painful process of getting something approved by Maldex in uh, the, the DES system for us. So when you look at PGDX LU, uh, again, it's, it's a pretty comprehensive. It's a DNA only, 500 plus genes. Uh, and again, it, it, along with TMB and MSI, uh, which hits all your NCCN guidelines which are required for solid tumors. It's uh, only FDA approved protocol. Uh, and, and, and as I said, it's, it's truly NGS in the box that you don't need to get multiple vendors for the fragmented workflow of NGS. So you do the DNA isolation, library prep sequencing, the primary alignment, and the, the results with the tier reporting comes from a single vendor, and if, not, if something doesn't work, you can always blame uh, one company rather than trying to figure out what has happened during your run. There are two controls, uh, and I, as I said, it's an IBD locked in uh, to, the, to the level that it, it is not overwhelming to bring something like this uh, quickly. And, and again, I said it's valid, validation versus verification is pretty significant difference. If you're starting, uh, of getting a comprehensive genomic profiling in the lab. Again, it, it utilizes everything in the lab. Uh, it's, it's a very local server in the lab, so you don't need to worry about cloud. Uh, there, are, there are very strict requirements at some institute what genomic data goes outside your institute. Uh, and, and then I said it's a the DNA only protocol. So even the, the translocations are DNA only, so you have one protocol and you do get some uh, copy number changes as well as clinically relevant translocations from DNA only so you don't need, you don't truly need an RNA component uh, like other panels. So as I said, a lot of cancer centers are interested to create their own personal genomic database and for us this has been a starting point in that discussion. So this is how the workflow looks like, you, you get a kit which pretty much is the library prep post DNA isolation. Sequencing is in on the NexSeq DX. And then the bioinformatics is a server which is locally installed in your lab, which can be uh, used uh, by intranet, not internet, intranet. So the IT installation is relatively very acceptable. I mean, the amount of paperwork on the time it takes to get something uh, approved by IT, this was a relatively uh, easy process. And then as I said, the, the reporting and everything is pretty much locked in because of it's an IVD product. So these are some of the uh, important information about the, the PGDX LU, which I think uh, made us go in that direction, is they already have a PLA code, the 0250U, the national reimbursement as of this year in January is 29900, which is CMS, uh, and that, that, that goes along with what our local MAC, uh, Palmetto, has uh, approved. And, and as you can see, uh, pretty much uh, around 40 states or 81 Medicare uh, beneficiaries are covered or are approved to be paid at that particular rate with the national coverage. And one of the advantage, if you are in the lab business uh, program, which I am, Medicare pays within 14 days, so you know if you're doing it right or wrong. So there's no six months or nine months waiting period, no back and forth, it's vertical. Uh, yes, we're gonna pay, this is your reimbursement. No, we're not gonna pay, the end of story. So having some of these uh, answers quickly coming through makes you a little bit comfortable on to which path you want to choose. And I think the getting an IVD from a manufacturer is a, uh, is, is a, is a, is a it's great, golden, because you don't have to worry about all the kinks of validation and submitting a TA. And, and then as pretty much all everyone in this room know about the valid act that is a reality at some point is going to happen so having something in this like this in your armor will definitely make sure that uh, we continue our promise of delivering precision oncology to our patients 
So this is how we got the, the Z code and the 81455, the magical CBD code, which gives you that 2,900 reimbursement. So this is uh, our lab's snapshot from DEX. This is a Maldex or Palmetto's uh, program where you submit all that information. You ask for a code and they give you, so most of not all the time, they'll give you 81479, which basically means nothing. Uh, but this is the only assay uh, which has 81455. And the most important thing is it is not only that the PGDX is approved, but our lab-specific PLA code is Medicare covered. So this probably blocks at the base of that entire page is the most important thing when you're doing it for Medicare beneficiaries. So in summary, a uh, lot of change in the last five years. So if, if you are not being following uh, in, in NGS reimbursement testing, please look at the slides. If I have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer but go and talk to your uh, hospital administration with all this data and then try to bring it back. And as I said, 10 years ago, NGS was definitely a cost center in the hospital. Now, with what vol whatever volume you have, it is definitely becoming uh, a revenue generator, at least cost neutral, or some of them have, some of these labs are pretty much making a good amount of uh, profit for the hospitals. I want to add something. So this is, I mean, I've been with CGC for a long time. This is my son, Ishan. Uh, I came here in 2006 for a talk, and he was seven days old. And I came in 2017, he was one year old. Last year when we did uh, the virtual, I was actually sitting in his birthday party. He was five year old. And believe me or not, Today is his birthday, August 1st, 2022, he turned six years old. So he's saying CGC. <laughs> so we celebrated his birthday on Saturday and we have a party on coming Saturday. So thank you, CGC. And I know a lot of people had questions, so I said I have a few things put on for them. But uh, we do a lot of things, and as I said, I'm just the face of the lab, but most if not all the work is done in the people in the lab. And, and these are the people who truly drive. Uh, Nikhil is here, he's now an LGG fellow, but he's still gonna be part of the lab as long as I want. And <laughs> thank you. Thank you.